Every year, more than 300 million square feet of artificial turf is installed around the world, enough to cover over 5,000 regulation-size American football fields. This grass-like material is actually a multi-billion dollar industry that most people never picture correctly. Behind its bright green surface is the story of a material engineered to overcome the limits of natural grass under high-intensity use. From stadiums to residential areas, it stays color-stable, resists heavy abrasion, and maintains performance even after thousands of hours of continuous operation each year. Join the Factorin as we explore why artificial turf has become a strategic choice in modern construction and how it is reshaping the way people create functional green spaces in everyday life. The artificial turf industry generates six to seven billion dollars every year, driven largely by its ability to stay in constant use, something natural grass simply cannot withstand. Its surface remains consistent and unaffected by weather, allowing stadiums and community fields to operate at high frequency while still keeping a reliable playing quality. Installation is also significantly faster. The turf is rolled out over a prepared base and can be used almost immediately. With no need for watering, mowing, or fertilizing, maintenance costs drop sharply and water consumption falls to nearly zero. Thanks to the combination of high usage efficiency and low upkeep costs, artificial turf is increasingly becoming a strategic choice for modern sports projects. The production process begins with receiving the base plastic pellets, primarily polyethylene and polypropylene, Two polymers chosen for their flexibility, strong elasticity, and resistance to outdoor aging. The bags of pellets are stored in a dry, ventilated area to prevent moisture absorption, because even a small amount of moisture can create air bubbles during melting and reduce the quality of the turf fibers. At the same time, essential additives such as UV blockers and heat stabilizers are prepared in powder or ultrafine pellet form. These are the ingredients that allow the fibers to retain their color under sunlight and avoid becoming brittle after years of use. All materials are sorted according to specific production formulas, labeled by batch and kept near the mixing area to ensure consistency before entering the fiber forming stage. At the feeding station, workers pour the bags of polyethylene or polypropylene pellets into the hopper of the extruder. The pellets slide into the heating barrel, where high-power heaters raise the machine temperature to about 410 to 480 degrees Fahrenheit. At this level, the material softens and then transitions into a uniform molten state. Once the melt reaches the desired viscosity, it is pushed outward through a die plate filled with tiny holes at the front of the machine. Right after leaving the extrusion die, the polymer strands still hold a very high temperature sometimes above 300 degrees Fahrenheit. They are soft, prone to shrinkage, and not yet stable in shape. To prevent deformation from the very first second, the entire stream is guided directly into a water cooling bath positioned below the extruder head. The water is kept at about 68 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, creating a sharp temperature drop that freezes the cross section almost instantly. This thermal shock gives the fiber a smooth, rounded surface with no ripples, like locking a shape in place while it is still soft and before it can distort. Inside the bath, each strand passes through guide rollers that keep them separated, because even slight contact during the semi-molten state can cause surface adhesion and defects that are difficult to correct. Once the outer layer has hardened enough to hold its shape, the downstream take-up system increases roller speed, putting the fibers under constant tension. This is the critical moment. The tangled polymer chains inside begin to straighten along the pulling direction, bonding more tightly and forming a much more ordered structure than before. The greater the stretch ratio, the higher the tensile strength and elasticity, and the better the fiber stands upright once tufted into the turf backing. By the time the strands exit the draw unit, they are no longer the molten stream that left the die, but a reinforced fiber built for abrasion resistance and long-term durability. They are now strong enough to survive years of sunlight, rain, cleats, and thousands of matches. This is the moment the polymer fully transitions from raw material into true artificial grass fiber, 
resilient, stable, and ready to continue down the production line. After passing through the cooling bath and the stretching zone, the turf fibers are guided straight into the winding system. Here, dozens of parallel strands are wrapped continuously onto rotating green spools, layer by layer, until each roll reaches its full size. Anywhere from a few kilograms to well over 10, depending on capacity. A single roll often contains 5 to 12 miles of fiber, enough for one uninterrupted weaving run without changing supply mid-process, which is crucial for preventing color streaks or density variation in the final surface. The core requirement at this stage is simple but unforgiving. Wind evenly, maintain proper tension, avoid overlap. If the winding speed climbs too high, the strands overstretch and lose elasticity. Too slow, and they slacken, overlap, or tangle, causing breakage later during weaving. The machine maintains constant tension automatically, while operators stand by to monitor alignment, correct strand guidance, or replace spools once full. A clean roll with fibers packed flat, consistent, and aligned in one direction is visual proof of a well-tuned line. The more uniform the roll, the smoother the weaving process and the cleaner the turf surface will appear. This is the moment the polymer strands stop being loose material and become a stable feed source. No longer individual threads running freely through the line, they are now an organized unit, tensioned, color consistent, and ready to enter the weaving stage where they will become the visible turf of the playing field. Once winding is complete, the fiber rolls are never stored on the floor or transported loosely. They are mounted onto a creel rack, a multi-tier steel frame with hundreds of rotating shafts, each holding a single roll that spins freely under the pull of the weaving machine ahead. With every roll arranged in parallel at fixed spacing, the threads feed smoothly without rubbing, twisting, or tangling, even during continuous operation for many hours. Operators only step in to replace rolls when supply runs low. Tension and feed rate remain controlled automatically by the line. From the rack, these hair-fine strands pass through alignment rollers, where they are grouped into straight rows and guided into the needle zone. This is where turf takes shape. Hundreds of needles move up and down like a giant sewing machine, hooking the fibers through the backing below before pulling them back up to form standing loops. Each loop becomes a synthetic root, and although it is only polymer, this loop lock structure anchors the blades firmly enough to withstand everyday use without pulling out. The backing typically consists of two bonded layers, a strong lower layer that carries tension and a softer upper sheet for needle penetration. As the machine runs, row after row of grass appears, spaced just millimeters apart but visually seamless. No gaps, no misalignment, no broken lines. Modern looms can produce 10 to 20 feet of turf per minute, meaning a single shift can generate enough turf for an entire full-size soccer field. At the exit end of the loom, what comes out is no longer loose thread, but a defined turf mat, a green surface, upright fibers, density uniform to the eye, a continuous field rather than individual polymers. This is the moment the material stops being raw feed and becomes a surface, something you can lay down, look at, and immediately recognize as the future floor of a stadium. Right after weaving, the turf sheet is still not ready for use because each fiber is held only by a mechanical loop. Grip strength at the contact point between fiber and backing is low, and a blade can still be pulled out by hand. To increase bonding strength, the sheet is sent through a latex coating system where liquid adhesive is pumped continuously onto the underside. Doctor blades and rollers spread the coating into a thin, even layer across the entire surface. The goal here is not thickness, but penetration, to seal and saturate the fiber roots. As it passes through the coating zone, the latex flows into the gaps, filling the space between every stitch loop and the backing surface. The adhesive then begins to stabilize, forming a film around the base of each fiber. This significantly increases anchoring strength and reduces the likelihood of fibers being pulled out during real use. Penetration and initial setting happen quickly, but bond strength continues to grow in the next stage, drying. 
The turf sheet then enters a heated curing chamber or continuous drying conveyor. The temperature is controlled carefully so that the latex forms a cohesive bonding layer without warping the backing. Once dried, the underside becomes stable and firmly locked, making separation between fiber and weave structure extremely difficult. At this point, the turf transitions from raw woven form into a fully bonded construction, mechanically stronger and ready for the next phase in production. Once the latex layer has fully bonded, the turf sheet moves to the perforation zone for drainage. Here, heated blades or mechanical punches create holes through both the backing and the latex layer in a repeating pattern. The spacing between holes usually ranges from 1 to 4 inches depending on field construction standards, and each opening must be wide enough to allow water to drain downward without weakening fiber anchorage. Every punched hole must be clean, round, and smooth-edged. No burnt rims, no tearing, because any flaw at this stage directly affects long-term durability outdoors. The punching speed and hole density are synchronized with the conveyor feed. Too few holes in water will pull on the surface, creating slip hazards. Too many and the backing loses structural strength and tensile resistance. For this reason, the perforator runs on fixed parameters, calibrated to drain heavy rainfall efficiently while maintaining mechanical stability of both backing and latex. When the sheet exits this station, the underside displays a continuous, uniform grid of drainage holes, aligned even and ready to carry water down through the base layer under all weather conditions. With perforation complete, the turf now possesses a finished structure with fully formed surface and drainage capability. This marks the end of the technical base treatment stage before the mat is flattened, rolled, and prepared for packaging. After perforation is complete, the turf moves into inspection. First, it is examined directly on the line, where operators scan the surface under strong lighting to catch defects quickly. Uneven pile height, density variation, weave offset, or drainage holes that are not perfectly round. Any questionable point is marked immediately for localized correction or removal from the roll. Meanwhile, representative samples are taken to the lab for testing fiber anchor strength, compression recovery, and drainage speed. Core evaluations include pull-out force under standard load, surface abrasion to simulate cleat friction, and water permeation testing to measure flow rate through punched holes. Once both visual inspection and lab performance pass specification, the turf advances to the final stages of production. After inspection, qualified turf sheets move into the flattening and pile setting zone, where rollers lift the blades back upright and remove any creases left from processing. Immediately afterward, the winding system pulls the mat onto a paper or PVC core, with winding speeds synchronized to the conveyor to prevent slack, wrinkling, or backing slip. Roll diameter depends on production length, and commercial rolls typically range from 65 to 230 feet, suitable for small fields or combined later for full-size pitches. Once the roll reaches the required length, the machine cuts the sheet automatically and the edge is secured with industrial tape to prevent separation. The roll then enters packaging, wrapped with PE or PP film, to guard against dust, moisture, and abrasion during transport. Finally, identification labels are applied for order tracking and product type, and the roll is placed onto pallets for dispatch. At this stage, the product is fully built, structurally bonded, drainable, and field ready. It is shipped out to school grounds, sports centers, residential fields, or professional stadiums, where it will be unrolled, seamed, and put into play. From the factory, turf rolls are transported to the site and laid directly onto the prepared base. The subsurface is typically fine stone or light concrete graded with slope for drainage, so rainwater flows downward through the perforation holes instead of pooling on the field. Each roll is unrolled along the planned layout and tensioned evenly to prevent rippling or blistering during use. Once aligned, the edges between adjacent rolls are trimmed matched and bonded with specialized seam tape. The joint is pressed tightly with a roller so the seam remains invisible. The perimeter of the field is then pinned or screwed into the foundation, ensuring the turf does not shift under heavy impact. 
The final step before play is infill. Adding rubber granules and silica sand if the field requires standard ball bounce. The infill is spread evenly by specialized applicators and brushed in so particles settle into the fiber base, keeping turf blades upright without collapsing during play. When the surface reaches uniform height and infill density, the field is ready for use. From raw polymer pellets to the green field where hundreds of matches are played every week, artificial turf is far from a simple product. It passes through high temperature extrusion, fiber stretching, spool winding, creel feeding, weaving onto backing, latex bonding, drainage perforation, inspection, rolling, packaging, and finally installation on the pitch. Every stage has its own tolerance limits, and each step plays a decisive role in the lifespan and stability of the surface you see in real life. What looks familiar under your feet is actually the outcome of an entire industrial chain behind it. If you enjoy deep dive breakdowns like this, inside factories, production lines, and materials technology, follow the channel so you never miss the next investigation. Tell me what material you want to see explored next. Footballs, goalkeeper gloves, turf shoes, or even the shock pad system beneath the field. Comment just one keyword and I'll handle the rest.